Hey everybody, it's 6.07 a.m. It's March the 2nd, ah, in the supposed year of 2017, and I'm really glad to be with you today. I'm happy that I was able to get done what I had on my schedule to get done this morning, so I can bring what bit of information that I have in my head and what thoughts are knocking around in there so that hopefully the end result would be to get you thinking as well and get you looking at some of these things so that you will as well through perhaps videos um, perhaps writing blogging or just speaking whatever happened to public speaking we need to start doing that more often. I've considered it myself, putting together PowerPoint presentations and doing public speaking. Print up some, print up some, uh, some flyers on a topic. Get people together. Get people to gather in a place. It doesn't have to be a big place because you're not going to get that many people to come out at first. You know, we've all been, we've all been so separated. Walls have been built between us so badly. I mean that we don't even talk to our own neighbors. But it's something that needs to come back. And, and I say that, and I'm kind of excited about it, because I've spent a little while now, before I decided to make this video, looking at old newspapers and considering the way that society was and how people interacted with each other only a hundred years ago. And the way it is today, with the technology we have today, you know, we're slaves to our iPhones and our social media and that's what we live through we live through our social media like as if that's life or that that captures the essence of people and who they are in any way shape or form and it doesn't we've got to get back to getting people together getting people together you know and that strength that is in bonding people together so we can find out that we're not so different I mean this is how this is how the uh, the Vatican New World Order is is able through all of their Vedas agents in the United States and abroad to bring up the kind of infantile separations that should never even be possible these days like trying to convince us that there is some kind of um, rudimentary difference between uh, those with more melanin in their skin and those with less, you know, Mexicans, Europeans, blacks, Asians, whites, when we're all people made in the image and likeness of our Creator Yahweh. And we can all be remade through His Son, Jesus Christ being made more and more every day into the image of Christ who was and yet still is the bodily human form of the fullness of the deity of Yahweh the Father we need to appreciate that more in one another and we need to gather together more with one another and not not just in these these cold uh, religious Sunday after Sunday churchianity services I mean for a multitude of reasons to talk about what our local politicians and our local governments are trying to get over on us you know through presenting us with budgets when they know full well that there's a secret Kaffir that nobody knows about where they're just hiding money away our government just in this country not to mention worldwide they have so much money that we don't know about national debt forget about it forget about it there's no reason to even have it but we're not gonna know about these things we're not gonna know what to do about these things we're not gonna have any kind of of mental philosophical psychological and more importantly spiritual solidarity between one another and especially the body of Christ if we keep living through our iPhones instead of getting together visceral 
you know, shoulder to shoulder, in one room, and experience things together. Public speaking, meetings, real things, living a real life, not through iPads and iPhones and computers, real life, living life. And that, in part, is what I hope to inspire some to do when they start considering these things. I want to inspire you because I can tell you with no self-imposed uh, faux humility that I am not, you know, I'm not more special than the next guy. I was born a, a very a normal person in a normal life in the backwoods of Indiana. And I was raised in a very normal farm type environment. We weren't farmers, but we were raised on a farm. We were rented a farm, farmhouse, barn on it. We did raise livestock, chickens, pigs. We raised a large garden. Our garden was about an acre total, stretched out wide across our property. So the rows were only about 20 feet deep, maybe. It was a big garden, though. But there was nothing special or abnormal about my life. It was about as normal as, as it gets. I'm, I'm, sh you know, I'm sure I was made in a un unique way uh, by the Father, like everybody is. And for some time now, I've been being remade, i.e. sanctified, uh, being remade in the image of Christ Jesus, the only begotten Son of the Father Yahweh. And so, that's, that's a very wonderful thing, but I think all of us, we still retain a certain uniqueness, though, even in that process. But all those things considered, um, there's, there's nothing all that, um, there's nothing all that special about me. It's just, maybe that, maybe it's just there's so many people out there that don't realize how unique and special and valuable they are. Because, yeah, through the education system and, and mass media, television, movies, um, disgusting things that should not even exist, like pornography, and ultra-violent sporting events and things like that, we have gotten this idea in our heads that man is less than what man really is. Or that we, individually, are less than what we really are. We are beings, and get this through your head, we are beings made after the image of and likeness of the almighty supreme being Yahweh God Elohim the creator of everything the sustainer of everything and if you are in Christ Jesus his only begotten son by grace through faith you can know that every day you are being more and more conformed to his image and thus to the image of the Father. That is something to be celebrated, absolutely celebrated about mankind. And we can all do Magnificent things in Him who strengthens us. And I do really hope to inspire some of you to go beyond where you're at. Because you are more than the lot in life that the insatiable machine has convinced you is all your life is going to add up to. I don't care if you're a janitor or a 
Ph.D. professor. You are not what you could be in Christ. So strive to be more. Don't tell yourself this, well, he's God, I'm not, I can't. Nonsense. You can do all things in him who strengthens you. This idea of Christ being co-equal, co-eternal with the Father, that was something that came along in the 4th century. It was pretty much unheard of before that time. He's remade, when I say he, Yahweh, has remade man in Christ. Look at Romans, first Adam, last Adam. The first Adam, sinful man. Man removed more and more every generation from that original image and likeness that Yahweh made Adam in, which was after himself. He became more and more and more and more and more removed until, I'm going to say about 1700 years ago. The Holy Spirit, <clears throat> that would be God's spirit and power, inseminated, well, not inseminated, because that implies semen, created life in the womb of Mary. And Jesus of Nazareth was born, the last Adam, all things being recreated after him. All those in him instead of growing further and further away from the image of God, now growing closer and closer and closer to the image of our Father and Creator. And that is a wonderful thing. So to continue on with this idea of a worldview by way of circumstantial evidence. Well, the nice thing is today, it doesn't have to be just circumstantial evidence, though I've spent a long time now thinking of the topic I'm going to discuss. Don't think that just because there is a bogus image on my screen of the way man supposedly evolved, which if you still believe in evolution, I do have a sincere, abundant amount of pity for you. But I'm not going to give you the generic, and I did say generic, Kent Hovind treatment on evolution. Not that I disrespect Kent Hovind. The work that he did when he was out there doing it, he really... He really made a lot of headway for those who are creationists. He did, and I respect him for it. What he's doing now, it's anybody's guess why he's doing it. I got some ideas, but I'm not ready to talk about them. But, yeah, he did, he did great work for a long time. But I'm not going to hit you with that. I'm not going to go into the same kind of paradigms that uh, the gentlemen that get together and do like the Seattle Creation Conference do, which if you don't have that on your YouTube as a channel, I get it because they, they do. There's a lot of those presentations that are really good. They're, they really are good. I'm not going to do that either. I'm not going to do that either. Because there's an idea today. And this idea pervades all of our society. And of course, I, gotta, I, have, to come from, I have to come from an American's perspective. That's what I am. And I know people of other countries would have different perspectives. But keep this in mind. 
that America, for at least the last century, has had more of an effect on the ideas and cultures of every other country and social structure in the world than maybe even the Roman Empire did in its day. Revelation 13, the second beast he exercises all of the power of the first beast in his presence. So that first beast hasn't gone away. It's had a seemingly mortal head wound. It's still there. It's still there. It's quiet. It's, it's in the shadows. But that second beast exercises all of the power of the first beast in its presence. He deceives all the people living on the earth. It's, it's very universal, the deception that that second beast causes to come to pass worldwide, all the people on the earth. So, me speaking from an American perspective, to a certain degree, I think I can also echo the perspective of many people in many cultures worldwide. And what we have is, We've got a culture now of people that not only those who are not Christians that don't believe the testimony of the Bible, either the Tanakh, which is not the Old Testament, it's the Tanakh, because that's still living, vital scripture. It's not old. It's the Tanakh and the New Testament, the Bible. You know, either those who don't believe the testimony of the Bible and those who do. This idea that's out there pervades the thoughts, the opinions, the theories, and the world view of virtually everyone. <clears throat> it's this idea. It's this, uh, it's this dodo mentality. Now, if you're into evolutionism, then of course you're going to believe things like that there were these eras, there were these long eras of time. When I say long, I mean millions of years. You believe in things like the Cambrian era. You believe in things like the Paleolithic era and the Jurassic period. All of these great millions and millions and millions of years of time. And you believe that creatures like dinosaurs, great reptiles of the land and the sea, thrived in this certain great long period, and then something, who knows what, caused them to go extinct, and this, well, that would have been pre time when, you know, man would have been in the evolutionary mind developing, though still extremely simian, I'm sure. But then, you know, after that, you would have had the animals thriving on the earth that were more like the mastodons and the saber-toothed tiger and giant sloths. And you have to actually shelf these things in these different eras, millions of years long and everything. Okay, so that's, that's a basic overview um, without being purposely insulting towards uh, evolutionism. Although I have no respect for it whatsoever, uh, the description I just gave, I wasn't being deliberately insulting. Just want to make that clear. Although it's absurd. But guys like oh, the ones who do, your guys like Kent Hovind, and Kent Hovind, Mike Riddle, oh, I can't think of them all. I can't include Hugh Ross because he's. <laughs> guys like that. What they do is they draw the line in the sand at the millions of years, way before the millions of years. And most of them 
most of them will group up and say, okay, we affirm that the Earth is somewhere between about six and 10,000 years old. Can't be any older. And then what they'll do is they will apply what, again, what the machine and secular science has given them concerning data, data on quote-unquote dinosaurs, which is a recent term, dragons, great lizards, and animals kind of like that, great, great sea animals, which wouldn't necessarily be lizards. Some of them would be fish. Um, I mean, even an eel is a fish. Okay, so a hundred foot long eel would be considered a sea serpent and a monster. Amphibian uh, type of animals. And then the animals I was talking about, like the mastodons or saber tooths and things like that. What they would believe then is that all of these creatures then were created uh, in the beginning and during the six day, six literal day creation of Yahweh, as recorded in Genesis 1 and 2. And that would happen was that many of these animals have gone extinct. They'll, they, they will give you reasons like, well, you know, brachiosaur-type animals had these huge bodies, but they had small nostrils. So, um, they started experiencing bouts of hyperventilation. And uh, eventually, since nobody had invented any giant breathers, they became extinct. Or they will tell you that the layout of the Earth became so different, and maybe with continental drift and uh, the freezing of the poles, because most of them believe that we live on a ball flying through space. <laughs> you know, when I look back on it, because I did, I mean, any of any of us who these days will say proudly and firmly, yeah, I'm a flat earther. Absolutely. Yeah, why? Well, I got common sense, A. And B, I believe in the scientific method, so I'm kind of locked into being a flat earther. But, you know, I believed in the globe too. I was just raised being told that. Just like the system I'm going to be talking about with the so-called extinction of so many species of animals. You really got to scrutinize this theory this paradigm because as I was saying even those people that would consider themselves as creation scientists they still believe this now they don't believe the same thing that like the evolutionists do where they believe that these different animals lived within certain eras in which they thrived and then blah 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 but they still believe that tons of species of animals have since the flood. And yes, I also believe it was a worldwide flood. Not local, not continental, worldwide. Just because I have common sense. Um, they still believe that after this, so Noah takes... All of these animals on the ark, they're all led to the ark by Yahweh, by the way. He spends a hundred years building an ark. An ark is not a ship. If you see it translated as ship, or you see it look like a ship in drawings or something else, reject it. Reject it violently. Tear it up. Do whatever. Because it's that's not what an ark is. An ark is a preservation container. Essentially, it is a box. It is a three-dimensional 
rectangle. And that's precisely how Yahweh told him to build it. He spent a hundred years building that ark. Him, his sons, he may have had hired contract labor. I don't know. I don't know. A hundred years. And the thing is, some people have said, well, you know, obviously Noah must have been a carpenter. No, that's not obvious. Just because Yahweh told him to build the ark and he told him how to build it doesn't mean he was a carpenter by trade. We don't know what trade he was. And he wasn't, we don't know he was a farmer either. In fact, I have reason to believe he wasn't because we see after the flood it says, and he became a husbandman, which means he became a farmer, specifically growing grapes. Now, what was Noah before that? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. I'll tell you this, though. We need to get out of our heads. We need to wipe our minds clean of this idea that we've got of John Huston playing Noah in his incompleted movie about the Bible, where Noah's basically wearing a dirt brown frock, uh, dirt farming, when Yahweh comes to him as a voice in his head and tells him to build an ark. Noah may have been an accountant. Noah may have been an energy specialist. You have to understand, just in our own time, the last real scientist that got by with living a full long life, although he was ruined financially by the powers that be, like J.P. Morgan, who really only works for the Rothschilds, who only work for the Vatican. But guys like Nikola Tesla, he is one of the last people with an understanding of the environment we live in who hasn't either been killed or silenced. Because there are scientists who understand that Yahweh created an environment for us to live in that's a very electric environment. The, the earth has its own vibration. This, this place we live in is full of energy. Full of energy. And those people before the flood, they, I promise you, I really do believe this, they would have known how to harness this energy in a way that was far more clean. Like today, the, the fuels that we use, they're not fossil fuels. Coal and oil and natural gas and the way that we use it and the way that we process it and burn it and all that stuff, it's terrible. It is junk. The gasoline combustion engine and all that, no, no. Those people before the flood, I promise you, they knew how to harness energy, real energy, clean energy, intelligent energy. And I believe that in many ways they were more advanced than us. Some might say if that were the case, why didn't many of them survive the Great Deluge? My answer to that would be, is first off, I don't know if a lot of people understand how violent it was from its start, with the fountains of the Great Deep bursting open. Massively violent. We're talking about a massively violent event like nothing that's ever happened before or since. So, at its start, massively violent. And throughout a good deal of its life, violent waves. There would have been so much just from the start that would have wiped people out. Consider all the animals and all the fish and everything else that were buried in mud because of the, the massive violence that happened. There were, there were those that they, they believed that they were tons and tons and tons and tons of fish in marine life that were probably killed by shock waves with the fountains of the great deep breaking open. This was an extremely violent event. And the design of the ark that Yahweh gave to Noah 
was by far and is still considered today by all those who design seafaring vessels to be the most stable vessel that could have been in uber violent waters so there's a lot of reasons why i could believe that not only was the antediluvian world more advanced than we are even today but in different ways but at the same time there are reasons why i believe that yes of course just like the bible says only eight survived with all the animals that yahweh brought into the ark now moving on why would yahweh have him spend a hundred years building a vessel like the ark and that was quite a vessel my friend that was something to behold only to bring all of those animals to him seven pairs of everything clean one pair of everything unclean every animal that existed on the earth that could not exist out in turbulent waters was brought onto the ark everything don't listen to the folk songs he didn't leave the unicorns out not that unicorns ever really existed that's a bad translation, by the way. King James only, people. Yeah, unicorn. That's a terrible translation. But uh, anyways, so he has, him, he has him build this fantastic preservation box. 100 years in the making. And he fills it. I'm pouring myself some coffee. you got to forgive me. i got to multitask while I have time. He fills it with every kind of species of animal on the earth that couldn't survive in those waters. So a lot of sea serpents and everything. He didn't have to. He didn't have to worry about them. They were they were they were fine. And preserves all of them through this worldwide catastrophe, only to bring them out on the other side and let them die. Let so many of them just die we've got this word today i can't stand it i can't stand this word because it is an ignorant word i can't believe anybody allows anybody else to use this word on them in what is considered intelligent conversation now i'm going to take a drink of my coffee and then i'm going to tell you the word Okay. Extinct. Extinct. Think about the implications of that word. For somebody to use that word. <laughs> It implies that they have the authority, they have the knowledge to guarantee you that an animal that once lived has been eradicated from the earth, even though there are and there are swaths of the earth so vast that no man has even penetrated them. The Amazon rainforest. Do you realize the square mileage of the Amazon rainforest? The Congo. All of the swamps of the Congo. All of the deserts on the earth <clears throat> all of the caves of the earth we can't begin to know all the underground chambers all of the caves of the sea we can't begin 
to know all of these parts of the earth. And I, <coughs> I, I didn't even name. I didn't even name all those areas within what's known as the Arctic Circle or past 30 south, which is called the Antarctic Circle, which, <clears throat> you know, look, guys, I'm not going to tell you that the flat earth is a circle with the sun and moon going around them, and I'm not going to tell you it's a square with the sun and the moon going across them. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you it's not a ball. And I'm going to tell you that it is a realm and an environment that our Creator made for us. And I hate, you know what? I can't stand when people compare it to a wildlife preserve or a terrarium or something like that. As if, as if the Almighty would make something so <laughs> common for us to dwell in. You could live a long, full life on this earth and still not begin to know the wonders just of the earth. Not even speaking of all of the wonders of Yahweh himself in heaven. So anyways, extinct and extinction. It's, it's nearly as incomprehensible and absurd a word to use in common sensible talk as atheist. You, you would have to somehow prove that you have searched and have all knowledge and that you could definitively prove that there is no God. In the same way, by using the term extinct, you have to affirm the same things. There's no proof. There's no proof that any species of animal has ever gone extinct. Ever. And why would, why would Yahweh preserve them all just to let them all die off? I'll give you this. There's a lot more people on the earth now than there used to be. And when people start to grow in certain areas and multiply, they don't tend to get along very well with large animals, especially ones that seem kind of dangerous and scary. You know, they tend to fight them off. They tend to, because, you know, man is extremely resourceful and very good at hunting and working together. I, there's almost no creature that probably exists on this planet that man could not hunt down and kill. So, when man starts moving into their territory, which has happened again and again ever since the flood, and there's been stories of this which have been suppressed ever since then, these days the experts at suppressing this kind of information would be the Smithsonian, but in general, these stories have been suppressed for thousands of years now. and But this is what happens. So, yeah, there's a lot less of them, probably. And they happen to be far more elusive. But extinct? Well, when somebody says extinct, you know, my first response? Prove it. Because the burden of proof is on the people making the claim that certain animal species are extinct. The burden of proof is on them, not on us. It's on them. I, and I'll tell you something, concerning like um, good online libraries where you can find um, periodicals and newspapers that you don't have to pay for, that, that are just, you know, uh, logs of you know, old documents and things like that. Any of you that are listening to me that know of good resources to do research, to, to find these um, publications and periodicals and newspapers or old books or anything else, please tell me because I'm always looking. I'm always looking. And um, one of 
my favorite places now to find information is the Library of Congress. That's fantastic. It's great. There's there's so much there's so much you can get out of it. So I started a search earlier at Library of Congress um, on periodicals. Now I tried a couple of of general search topics, but it they were too broad. I was getting results in the mega hundreds of thousands, and I couldn't weed through it all. So I decided to condense my search. And you know, funny thing is, I found that even the next search I did, I did a search on sea monsters. I found that even that search was broad. When I punched in sea monsters, Library of Congress gave me about 260,000 articles from different newspapers all over the place. And, and their search range was from 1789 to 1924. How fantastic is that? That's 135 years <clears throat> worth of articles and periodicals. And at that time, th this information hadn't been as well suppressed as it is these days. So you get some real jewels. Now, all three of the stories I'm going to show you were all on the first page of my search. <laughs> so yeah, ain't that something? The wealth of articles. I have checked out uh, the three publications that I'm going to highlight here. And all of them are regular, normal, local newspapers. They're not sensationalist tabloids, which funny thing is, it's interesting about some papers that were, uh, that we were convinced were just rags. And we're finding out that there was actually quite a bit of journalistic integrity to a number of those papers that we were convinced were uh, yellow journalism sensationalist papers when in fact we're finding out that the major papers these days have been the real sources of lies and disinformation interesting interesting how all all these things are coming to light now three papers this first article is taken from the Washington Times December 29 1918 National Edition, the American Weekly Section, Image 26. Now, this was before the Washington Times turned into, um, well, the vomitous uh, organism of shameless propaganda. Okay, again, 1918. This is this is still where America and the American press were writing stories that were news and were newsworthy before they were <clears throat> massively suppressed. The title reads, Bones of an Ancient Sea Serpent Found in Louisiana. Wow, interesting. Subtitle, Why Science Believes That These Prehistoric Monsters May Still Be Living Far Down in the Ocean Depths. That was science in 1918. Now, you'll be hard-pressed to find a scientist these days that will say that because the Vatican's machine that they have slowly, surely installed in the United States and that, well, the beast, the deceptive monster the United States has become, <clears throat> has no room for things like honest scientists, much less honest journalists. But let's see, in 1918, you can see just real quick here, it is by Dr. W. H. Ballou, SCD, American Society of Ichthyologists and Herpetologists. The recent discovery in 
Catahoula Parish, Louisiana, of the complete skeleton of an ancient sea serpent 90 feet long. And the remarkable similarity of this fossil's outlines to the descriptions by mariners of monsters they asserted were seen by them in modern times is another confirmatory factor to scientists that in the depths of ocean today there really may be sea serpents. Now they found this 90 foot long skeleton of a sea serpent down in Louisiana and next to it they found another partial skeleton with a giant shark's tooth embedded into the other skeleton 1918 real quick let's look at the next art the next article you're gonna go no yes and I've checked out this newspaper. It is your total uh, run-of-the-mill local newspaper. You know, no sensationalism stories or anything like that. This is the story that came up May 17, 1914. Bones of Homer's one-eyed cyclops found. That's correct. Now, some of these images are hard to show, but this is, uh, <laughs> they featured an illustration of the giant cyclops getting ready to hurl a huge boulder at Ulysses and his crew uh, in Homer's story, The Odyssey. So, I'm just going to read little parts of this. You can find so much of this is so amazing in the Library of Congress's periodicals section. This is the story of the Cyclops, the hideous one-eyed monster who attacked Ulysses and his companions is one of the most thrilling passages in Homer's Odyssey. They go on to talk at length about the Cyclops described in Homer's Odyssey. Now, what's interesting is the pictures in this publication. The, the picture here on my screen where you see this giant figure and this thing has got like one big horn right here and you see the one eye and it looks all crazy looking like almost kind of claw like reptilian feet and all that just weird weird looking Re really strange it says below this picture how the monster whose bones have been found in sicily actually looked sketched by one of professor abel's companions. Now this Professor Abel, he's the guy who found this big crazy skeleton that they believe to be a Cyclops in 1914 Sicily. It's got another photo to the bottom right. It's really hard to make out, but you can tell there's a man here. He might be kneeling. It says, Excavation in Sicily showing the spot where Professor Abel of the University of Vienna has unearthed the remains of a possible cyclops. One more story. And this is just illustrating my point. This is why I'm not reading much on these stories, because you can find them. Find them yourself. I'll put the links in the description, I promise. This next story, this was from an Iowa newspaper small town in Iowa that it's called the Daily Gate City the headline reads sea monster is trapped within the coffer dam subtitle great hideous serpent 80 feet long found last night when water was lowered from the big pool in the river and then bullets fail to leave any mark. And then another subtitle below that, Writhing Leviathan, which is even more horrible than the fabled dragon of old or the flame belching brutes of, and they say, mythology. I don't think so. I do not think so. You read this article, and over the course of a couple, couple days, they had built this coffer dam and they were pumping out this coffer dam. It was a large area. 
And besides for, and I, by the way, there is another testimony. I was shocked to find this second testimony as part of the Daily Gate City by a different person that was testifying of the reality of this sea monster in this coffer dam. So it was near the Des Moines Rapids area where this was where this was found to be in this coffer dam they built. It's a river. Not an ocean. A river. This article though, it goes on to talk about this had happened over a few days. And <clears throat> I mean, they, the, the guys who were working on the coffer dam were so startled by what they had found. And the description of this thing, not pleasant. Wild description of its scales, the colors, its head, the teeth, the way it behaved, the way that they were shooting at it with bullets. They believed bouncing off its scales they said its scales were like armor now I know some of you a light bulb's gonna come on right away right and you're gonna mentally go right to Job 41 can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord can you put a rope in his nose or pierce his jaw through with a hook Will he make many petitions to you, or he'll, will he speak soft words to you? Will he make a covenant with you that you should take him for a servant forever? Will you play with him as a bird, or will you bind him for your girls? Will traders barter for him? Will they part him among the merchants? Can you fill his skin with barbed irons or his head with fish spears? Lay your hand on him. Remember, remember the battle? and do so no more. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Won't one be cast down even at the sight of him? None is so fierce that he dare stir him up. Who then is he who can stand before me? Who has first given to me that I should repay him? Everything under the heavens is mine. I will not keep silence concerning his limbs, nor his mighty strength, nor his goodly frame. Who can strip off his outer garment? Who shall come within his jaws? Who can open the doors of his face? Around his teeth is terror. Strong scales are his pride shut up together with a close seal. One is so near to the other, that no air can come between them. They're joined one to another. They stick together so that they can't be pulled apart. His sneezes flashes out light. His eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning torches. Sparks of fire leap forth. Out of his nostrils a smoke goes as of a boiling pot over a fire of reeds. His breath kindles coals. A flame goes forth from his mouth. There is strength in his neck. Terror dances before him. The flakes of his flesh are joined together. They are firm on him. They cannot be moved. His heart is firm as a stone, firm as the lower millstone. When he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid. They retreat before his thrashing. If one attacks him with the sword, it can't prevail, nor the spear, the dart, nor the pointed shaft. He counts iron as straw, brass as rotten wood. The arrow can't make him flee. He laughs at the rushing of the javelin. His undersides are like sharp potsherds, leaving a trail in the mud like a threshing sledge. He makes the deep to boil like a pot. He makes the sea like a pot of ointment. He makes a path shine after him. 
one would think the deep had white hair. On earth there is not his equal that is made without fear. He sees everything that is high. He is king over all the sons of pride. And I don't even think what they found was a Leviathan. Although they put that in the headline because it made a catchy headline. I believe, based on a good deal of circumstantial evidence, based on just thought, pondering, meandering, thinking, just thinking, that our world today is not so much different than Noah's world was, than Abraham and Job's world was. There's more people. But extinction? Prove it. You know, a lot of swimmers, casual fishermen, small boaters, get attacked or go missing all the time. And it's not reported on. People get attacked in the water and it's always called a shark. People go missing in the water all the time. And you don't hear about it. Hikers, naturalists, campers go missing. You don't hear about it. They want to tell us that things like the Thunderbirds that the natives of America talked about were either legend or some large species of bird that we have today, rather than the fact that they were most likely pteranodon and they were terrible animals. There are some natives in some parts of the world that still report um, of seeing them along certain waterways and are terrified of traveling those waterways by canoe because they have a name for them and the name equates to boat tipper. They'll live up in craggy cliff areas along rivers and those are usually the rivers that those natives don't want to travel because those birds like to, to live up there and watch the waters for any sort of prey that they can get. They see it coming along in a canoe. They swoop down, knocking over the canoe. And once the people are in the water thrashing around, trying to, to stay afloat or survive or get to shore, they swoop back down, grabbing them up with talons that are probably many inches long, piercing them, causing a lot of wounding, laceration of the flesh, and then bringing them back to wherever it is they uh, have their nest in, killing them probably rather quickly if the ordeal doesn't kill them already, and I mean if they don't end up um, well, piercing their lungs or other organs in scooping them up from the rivers and then kill them back at their lairs. Why do you think so many legends of the heroes who were dragon slayers or the great men who killed monsters were so revered and so cherished by so many cultures, stories like Beowulf. And maybe it's because this world is what this world was. And all they've done is pull the wool over our eyes and paint a picture of something that's very unrealistic 
a world that doesn't exist. A world that's impossibly billions of years old. Millions of years old. <laughs> On a ball. Spinning around. Flying through space. Aimlessly. And for some reason, so many people are so comfortable there that when you try to tell them that that's probably not the place we live, they, they fight, they resist. They don't want to know. They like the safety and, and the comfort that these deceptions have afforded them. But I want to live in the world that Yahweh has created and that Yeshua, Jesus, has created anew. And that will someday ultimately be entirely recreated with us all made perfect. And I want to dwell with this Creator and His only begotten Son that He has given authority to over all in heaven and on earth forever. I want to live in the real world now. And I want to understand my Creator, my Savior and King, and this world that they've made and preside over. And there's a lot more that could be found out and that could be said about the difference between the world that people and places and entities like the Smithsonian and modern terrified science, because that's what it is. Modern scientists, they either love the current model because the current model affords them to live any way they want without the necessity of answering to adjust God. They don't want to believe even how merciful he is. But they don't want to answer to a just God. Guys like Richard Dawkins. So they either love the model because of that. Or they're too afraid. They're too afraid of losing their jobs, losing their position, losing their respect if they go against the mainstream views by speaking the truth or even questioning it because they're cowards. They're cowards. They don't have enough belief in anything to go against the system and to do what's true and what's right. They know it'll cost them and they have no faith in anything. So that's who dominates this establishment that's been telling us the way that the world supposedly is. And there's just so much evidence that it's nothing like what they tell us. And that it's everything like the Bible tells us. And it yet still is. So looking at the clock, I see that I got to get moving. It's already 7.27 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I've got a lot to do. So I was glad to be able to make this video today and I'm excited about the
topics that I'll be able to continue to talk about in a series of, well, who knows how many episodes it'll be on our worldviews, constructing our worldviews. Because I know that today, a lot of us are having to reconstruct our entire worldview. So we're going to have to take a look at, oh, I don't know, everything. Decide how much of it's true or believable. And what we're going to put our faith in. I would encourage you to put your faith not just in the Holy Bible, the Word of God, specifically His Messiah that He sent here to be a sacrifice for your sins so that in believing in Him you would receive forgiveness of your sins and you would be reconciled to the Father. Imagine that. Reconciliation. A personal relationship to the one who made all of this. That's the one worldview I would suggest you concentrate on first. Everything else will follow. So until next time, I just got three things to say. One is that Jesus is Lord. The second is God's kingdom is forever. And the third thing is that I am your servant. Farewell.